So I had given you all a question and I had asked you uh, where is elastic cartilage found the last time we finished. So epiglottis, epiglottis yes, external ear. Very good, very good. That's where you see. So you can remember E for elastic epiglottis ear, okay? And fibrocartilage, remember, it doesn't have a perichondrium. And one important feature of fibrocartilage, so much collagen fibers, uh, remember, because it has collagen, it has great strength. So fibrocartilage is always found in areas where you need a lot of strength, which is why it's present in the intervertebral discs. So in the intervertebral discs, which are present between vertebrae, in the area between the two hip bones called the pubic symphysis. So that's another area that you find fibrocartilage. Pardon? Meniscus, yes. Meniscus in the knee. Yes, meniscus in the knee. That's where a menisci for plural. There too, you need, you need it to absorb. It's, it's like a shock absorber. So even the IV discs are shock absorbers. So that's where you find this. And, you know, others you can look up in your notes. Let's move on to bone. So bone is connective tissue where the matrix is hard because of deposition of salts in it. And you have two types of bone. One is called compact bone and this is a picture of compact bone. And the other one here is called spongy bone or also known as cancellous bone. As the name suggests, Compact means it's really compact. Everything is in a very orderly fashion. Spongy is, can break easily. So let's look at compact bone and what you see in compact bone. The basic, histologically, the basic unit that you see in the bone is made up of something which is known as a heversion system or also known as an osteon. It's also called an osteon or a Heversion system. And what either one of these contain is they contain a central canal, which is this one here, which is called the central canal or the Heversion canal. And it's filled with blood vessels. And then around them you have plates of bone. So you have many plates of bone. And, you know, they look like the rings on a tree, you know, when you cut a tree and you can look at that. So you have many rings going around. There's no specific number. And then... This one last ring, it ends. It's very clearly seen. So you'll have them like this. So you'll have, this is one osteon. This is another. So this is how you can differentiate. And in between them, you'll just have bones, plates like this, which are given different names, which are called interstitial lamellae. So this plate of bone, which you see going around this Heversion canal, this plate of bone, which you're going, along, uh, going around, is known as a lamella. A lamella means like a plate. So you have many lamellae which go around this. And into so these lines are all the lamellae. And these are also plates of bone, but because they are between two osteons, they don't belong to any one particular osteon. These are often known as interstitial lamellae. Now, osteoblasts are cells which give these osteoblasts are the cells which lay down bone. They are the ones which actually lay down these bony plates or lamellae. And when they lay down these bony plates, they get caught in between them. And when they get caught, they sort of lie in a space. You remember how cartilage chondrocytes were lying in a space known as a lacuna? Similarly, these cells, because they be belong to bone, these osteoblasts, after they've laid down lamellae, they kind of get caught in between those plates. They then are known as osteocytes. So they are known as osteocytes. And they are also seen present in a bony space, which is known as a lacuna. Just as you had chondrocytes in lacuna, you have osteocytes in lacuna. The function of osteocytes is not really clear because once osteoblasts lay down bone, they become osteocytes and get caught. They think that should the need arise, these osteocytes also at some point can lay down bone matrix. But for all practical purposes, laying down of bone is done by osteoblasts. Now when bone is laid down, 
it's not laid down in this orderly fashion. So sometimes you might have more in one area, less in another area. So let's say you are forming a bone. And when we do skeletal system, we'll see this again. Let's say you are forming a bone and you had more over here. And you wanted to remove this part of bone. So you have a cell which removes bone. And that cell which removes bone is known as an osteoclast. So osteoclasts remove bone, osteoblasts lay down bone, and osteocytes are the osteoblasts which have been caught between the lamellae. Now I said that this Heversian canal was the one which contained blood vessels. So all these cells need nutrition, and they have to take it from the blood vessels which are present here in the central canal or Heversian canal. So in order to take nutrition from there and then pass it on to the cells which are further back, you have little channels which are present and these channels are like tiny canals, so these are known as canaliculi. So canaliculi connect the osteocytes to each other and they connect them to the central canal. So the one that is closest to the central canal will first take its nutrition and then pass it on. It will go to the next one. Can you see? It's like a highway going all through. Okay, so the connecting channels. Here, this is a large picture showing just one area. So you can see this is the lacuna or space. This is an osteocyte in it. And here are the canaliculi where it is connected on all sides to the other osteocytes. And that's how it's able to take nutrition and pass it along. In contrast to compact bone, spongy bone, you don't have this orderly arrangement. Instead, the bony plates are present in a haphazard fashion. So they kind of, you know, they could be, instead of being round like this, they are present in all odd directions this way. And so they leave little spaces inside, and these are the spaces which are filled with bone marrow. And they are present, filled with bone marrow throughout life, which is why spongy bone is a site of bone marrow production throughout life. So when you look at it histologically, these bony plates are cut in very thickness like this, these are known as trabaculi here. These are called trabaculi. And inside the trabaculi, this blue arrow is pointing to an osteocyte, which has been trapped in between. And here are the marrow cells, those spaces which are present between trabaculi. Okay. What These osteoblasts lay down trabaculi, then they get caught inside and they are called osteocytes. Sorry? What, what is it though? It's a bony plate. Okay. But in, in the lamella, we call it lamella when it is nice and neatly arranged like that. So here, because it's kind of in a haphazard fashion, we call it a trabaculi. But it's still the same thing. It's a bony plate like a lamella. Okay? The periosteum. Remember I said all bones have periosteum. And the periosteum is the one which has inside it... Uh, Let's go back. So the periosteum, so if you look at a bone, when a, when a bone is finally formed, so let's say again to take this bone like this, this outer area is called periosteum and inside, in the inside of the bone, especially a long bone when you have a thin marrow cavity inside, that inner part is known as endosteum and this outside is called periosteum. All bones have periosteum with the exception of some bones which we will do later in the skeletal system which are known as sesamoid bones. These are bones which grow in the tendon of a muscle. You all know your kneecap, the patella, is a sesamoid bone. Sesamoid bones don't have periosteum. You know, like I gave you the example, articular cartilage does not have a perichondrium, right? So sesamoid bones don't have periosteum, but otherwise all bones have periosteum. And this periosteum and endosteum both are actually sites where osteoblasts are present. So if, if ever there is a fracture in a bone like this, what will happen is that bone grows and attaches back, right? It's because this periosteum contains those osteoblasts, they can lay down new bone and they can heal that fracture, okay? Let's look at the next connective tissue, which is blood. Now, blood, you'll all wonder, how can blood be called connective tissue? I mean, it is fluid. But that's the matrix which is fluid. 
the ground substance. So blood is actually called an atypical type of connective tissue. It's not typical. So atypical type of connective tissue because it has cells which are the red blood cells, which are these red blood cells, platelets and white blood cells, which are also known as leukocytes. It has ground substance, which is plasma. So plasma is the ground substance. Remember, connective tissue has to have fibers, ground substance and cells. So it has cells. It has plasma, which is fluid. The fibers are not seen normally. They are only seen when blood clots. That's why we call it atypical connective tissue. And when blood clots, the fibers which are seen are known as fibrin fibers or fibrin threads. So these are called fibrin threads or fibrin fibers. So that's why it's atypical. You only see it when blood clots. So here if you look at a slide of uh, blood, so this, all of this straw colored area is plasma, which is the ground substance. These salmon colored here cells without a nucleus are the red blood cells. They are the most predominant of the cells. Their function is to carry oxygen. Remember they have a pigment hemoglobin inside them which helps to trap oxygen and they carry oxygen to the tissues. Then we have white blood cells and these white blood cells are either granulated or they are not granulated. So we call them granulocytes or if they don't have granules we call them agranulocytes. So this is the white blood cells. The granulocytes are neutrophils, eosinophils and basophils. So eosinophil, basophil and another one called neutrophil. So see the similarity, they have the word fill at the end of it. They all have granules in them. So if you compare them, this is a neutrophil. This here is a neutrophil. Like here, you can see this is a neutrophil. Its granules are colorless or neutral color. You can't really tell the color. That's why it's called neutrophil. The second cell which is here is called an eosinophil. Here the granules are anywhere from light pink to reddish orange. So they may be light pink, dark pink, pinkish orange, orangish pink, deep red, you know. So they a variety of uh, colors. They can be really darkly stained. They usually tend to have a bilobed nucleus. That means only two lobes in a nucleus. The eosinophil. So you can see a, it looks like a sunglass. Compare this to a neutrophil. Can you see it has many lobes? Look at this, many lobes. The nucleus is not one single one. It's kind of broken up into little bits which are called lobes. So many lobed, the neutrophil is many lobes. And then we have a basophil, which usually has kind of an S-shaped nucleus. It's sometimes very difficult to look at the nucleus. But here, if you notice, look at the color of the granules. Dark purplish or dark blue. Very, very deeply colored granules. The function of these three, the neutrophil is phagocytic. Usually engulfs bacteria. In phagocytosis, remember we did uh, earlier, I gave you example, macrophage is a phagocyte. Neutrophils are phagocytes. You'll see later in the central nervous system, there's a cell called a microglia, which is again a phagocyte. Eosinophils, they, these granules of eosinophils, they are liberated when anybody has an allergic response or they have parasitic infestation. You know, parasites inside, you've heard of Lyme disease, so the bite of a tick gives you that Lyme disease. You may, people may have worms in tropical uh, areas. So allergies and parasitic infections or infestations. The eosinophils help to fight that. So anyone who has a severe allergy usually has more eosinophil in their body at that time. Basophils are very, very few. 
very few in it's very difficult even to find on a slide sometimes you difficult to find basophils but their granules are very similar to if you remember when we did uh the connective tissue i talked about mast cells and mast cells liberate histamine and heparin basophils do the same thing they liberate histamine and heparin they take part in inflammation whenever there's chronic inflammation in the body the basophils take part no they take part in it they they liberate the histamine and heparin they don't cause the inflammation they take part that means they help to subdue the inflammation yes uh but they are very few so usually you know their um, activity is kind of limited and because they produce histamine and heparin they may also take part in allergic responses but again eosinophils are the main ones which take part in allergies rather than basophils because if you count 100 cells you're lucky if you find one basophil so you can see the amount is so few that you know it's not going to be that the second classification was that of a granulocytes where you don't have granules so those are monocytes and lymphocytes so here is a monocyte and here is a lymphocyte the monocyte again is phagocytic because it has lot of cytoplasm look at it it's a very large cell it's the largest of the cells the blood cells very very large lot of cytoplasm so like the neutrophil it also is phagocytic the lymphocyte is the one which takes part in the immune response it produces antibodies or it may directly attack a cell like a cancer cell so the lymphocyte is responsible for doing that then lastly we have cells called platelets these are very very tiny cells some even call them just cell inclusions because it's difficult to find the nucleus and cytoplasm they are important because they take part in clotting of blood so anyone with a low platelet count will have problems with clotting of blood you know the blood will take will bleed they they will bleed for a longer time next tissue we are looking at so we finished with connective tissue now we are looking at muscle now muscle is classified in two ways based on whether it shows striation striations means lines so it is classified as being striated if it shows lines or non striated if it has no lines in it so i'll show you when you look at a muscle you'll see fine lines in some you won't see any lines in others based on action we classify it as either it is voluntary where where you can control it or involuntary where you cannot control it each muscle when you think of a muscle say let's say your biceps so this is the muscle and this is the tendon this muscle is actually made up of cells because muscle is a tissue tissue are, tissues are made up of similar cells right so it's made up of cells but we call these cells fibers okay so we call them muscle cells or also muscle fibers they mean the same thing do not confuse muscle fibers with collagen fibers you know those fibers are very thin and long like that they don't have a nucleus inside they are they are laid down by cells whereas a muscle cell or a muscle fiber is a cell like this which is long and has a nucleus it may have one or many nuclei okay so the the difference between a muscle fiber and a regular fiber like collagen fiber is that collagen fiber is very thin each single fiber is very thin doesn't have a nucleus inside and it is laid down by cells muscle fibers are muscle cells they're just called muscle fibers okay now inside each muscle fiber you actually have in if you take a muscle fiber and i'm uh, taking a muscle cell or a muscle fiber so let me just take one like this and let's say this is the nucleus inside it actually it's made up of thin little filaments these are known as myofibrils okay so the muscle cell itself is made up of little fibrils inside which are known as myofibrils now 
we talked about plasma membrane or cell membrane and cytoplasm. In the muscle, we tend to name the cell membrane or the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. We give it a different name. We call it sarcolemma. So this outside membrane which covers this cell is known as sarcolemma. It is the same as the plasma membrane or cell membrane. It's just given a different name because the word sarco has to do with muscle. So you'll find that everything with muscle will use the word sarco. And the cytoplasm inside is called sarcoplasm. Instead of cytoplasm, we call it sarcoplasm. Later when we do muscles in more uh, detail, you'll find that the endoplasmic reticulum in muscle is known as sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay? Just as we had hemoglobin which was present in red cells to trap oxygen, in muscles you have a pigment called myoglobin which acts very similar to hemoglobin. And this helps to trap oxygen. And that gives muscles a reddish color. So some, there are some muscles in your body which have a lot of myoglobin and they are red in nature. Especially those which have to act for a really, really long time like your postural muscles, the muscles at the back which keep you erect. Now let's look at the types of muscle. We have skeletal, smooth and cardiac. And if you were to classify them based on these two classifications, skeletal is striated and voluntary because it's under your control. Smooth is non-striated and involuntary. Cardiac is striated because you see these lines in cardiac muscle, but it is involuntary. You cannot control your cardiac muscle. Your cardiac muscle is present in your heart and just the beginnings of the blood vessels, but mainly in the heart. So you can't control that. So cardiac is striated and involuntary. Skeletal muscle, most of the muscles in your body, the ones that you know of, the ones that you go and train when you go to the gym, are all skeletal muscle. You know, like your muscles of facial expression, muscles of your limbs, muscles which between ribs, the intercostal muscles which help you to breathe. The diaphragm is also a skeletal muscle, even though that's one muscle which is inside the body cavity, but it's a skeletal muscle. And one um, interesting feature of skeletal muscles is the facial muscles, for example. They are actually inserted into your skin. Usually muscle is connects one bone to the other. So if there's a bone here and there's another bone here, usually muscle goes from one bone to the other. So it crosses a joint and that's how it acts on the joint. You know, its attachment is to bones. Uh, but the mu muscles of facial expression, they are actually inserted on your skin. That's the reason why when you get Botox and they put that Botox consists of a toxin which paralyzes the muscles of your, paralyzes muscles. But they inject it into the skin because these muscles are inserted into your facial skin. So your face then does not move at that time and there are no wrinkles formed. Okay. Smooth muscle is some involuntary and it is present. Can anyone give me an example of where smooth muscles would be found? In the eyes, uh, yes, when you talk about the eyes, these are the muscles which constrict and dilate your pupil. Those muscles, not the muscles which move your eyeball when you look up, down, right, left, not those. Those are skeletal. But the muscles which constrict and dilate your pupil. So these are known as sphincter and dilator pupillae, yes. <coughs> in the, yes, in the lung, when the, not in the lung itself, but the bronchi, yes, the smooth muscle covering the bronchi because they constrict the bronchi. People have asthma, they have bronchoconstriction, you cannot breathe properly there. Blood vessels have smooth muscle. Walls of organs, yes. Stomach, stomach yes, very good. Walls of organs like stomach, intestine. Urinary bladder, this is all smooth muscle. And you think of it, you cannot control. Can you control when you're going to con contract your stomach? You can't, right? So this is where you find smooth muscle. Cardiac muscle is, of course, present in the heart. Now the nerve supply. And an another important muscle, and I have that written here, is this muscle called erector pylorum. This is a muscle which you all have probably at some time or the other always felt the effect but may not have known about it. You know, when you're cold, your hair stands up, the hair on your on skin it stands up, 
or when you're frightened also sometimes your hair stands up especially animals the hair stands up so this erector pylorum is a smooth muscle which is present in the skin this is smooth muscle present in the skin and this is supplied by the sympathetic nervous system and later when we do the nervous system we'll see that the sympathetic nervous system is one of those systems which acts when you're really scared you know frightened like you all say you know uh, that adrenaline rush came through the fight or fright when you want to fight or really do well then too this sympathetic nervous system comes into play so this is the it supplies this smooth muscle so smooth muscle is supplied by a part of the nervous system which is called the autonomic nervous system of which you have sympathetic or parasympathetic these are the components of the autonomic nervous system so one way to remember the autonomic nervous system is an involuntary nervous system it has two parts sympathetic and parasympathetic so smooth muscle could be supplied by sympathetic or parasympathetic or even both the erector pylorum is only supplied by sympathetic blood vessels for example are only supplied by sympathetic but your stomach like the walls of the organs they have both sympathetic and parasympathetic okay so you don't have to kind of know which one supplies which one what i do want you to know is that the erector pylorum is supplied by sympathetic but otherwise smooth muscle elsewhere in the body when we start doing them we'll talk about them the smooth muscle elsewhere in the body is supplied by the sympathetic or parasympathetic or maybe even both cardiac muscle what do you think it will be supplied by would it be supplied by autonomic which is an involuntary system Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it also is supplied by uh, uh, autonomic because autonomic supplies invol. It's an involuntary system. You have no control over it. So it will supply cardiac muscle because you have no control over cardiac muscle. So autonomic nervous system supplies both smooth and cardiac, which are involuntary muscles. Skeletal muscle is supplied by something which is called the somatic nervous system. which is the voluntary nervous system the one that you can which is under your control now there are two terms that you should know with muscle and just so that you know when you go to the gym and you exercise and you want to you know bulk up your muscles and you know you pump iron and you want to get real beefy then your skeletal muscle increases it becomes bigger it looks larger especially if you're doing it well it uh, you know you can see that it'll uh, get larger in this case it's not the muscle becomes larger not because you're adding more cells to the muscle but because each individual muscle cell enlarges so if you if say for example your biceps has 100 muscle fibers when you pump iron and keep lifting up weights and your biceps gets bigger maybe the circumference increases that 100 remains 100 it's only that each cell becomes larger so it looks bigger and that process where a, the muscle cells enlarge enlarge in size that is known as hypertrophy hypertrophy is what happens normally in our body so whenever muscles increase in size whenever you see an increase it's usually hypertrophy so even the heart can enlarge suppose it has to push against pressure the heart enlarges it is because each individual muscle cell has become bigger and that's known as hypertrophy so hypertrophy is increase in size of a muscle cell or muscle fiber hyperplasia is an increase in number this is an increase in number this does not occur normally it may happen if someone has a tumor then you may have more muscle fibers added the only place in our body where it is normal for hyperplasia to occur which means increase in number of muscle fibers is the uterus especially the pregnant uterus or rather the pregnant uterus so when a woman gets pregnant and the uterus enlarges not only is there hypertrophy 
there's always hyperplasia also. So muscle fibers increase in size and they increase in number. So with the result, once the baby is born, the uterus never comes back to its original size. It's always a little larger because you have more muscle fibers now added to it. Okay. So the uterus is the only organ in the body which undergoes normal hyperplasia. Otherwise, anywhere else, if there's an increase, it is an increase only in size. Have any... Which one? What? It's steroids, when they, what they do is they bulk off muscles. Again, they cause hypertrophy. Okay. Yeah, not hyperplasia. Not hyperplasia. And of course, they have a lot of um, other undesirable side effects. Okay, yeah. So let's look at uh, muscle here. So we discussed that the outer layer uh, of each muscle cell is called sarcolemma. You should know classification, you know, striated or non-striated and then involuntary or voluntary. I told you about myoglobin, the pigment, which gives it its red color. And, you know, you've done connective tissue, and I've talked about connective tissue all this while, and I told you, like, you can see areolar tissue, you know, when you separate, like, when you buy a steak and you separate muscle bundles. So if you look at a muscle, imagine you were looking at a muscle, and we take a cross-section of a muscle like this, and say this is the biceps. On the outside of the biceps, there's connective tissue which covers the entire biceps. So this is going all around. This is known as perimysium. This whole biceps is not one big blob of muscle cells like this. It actually is broken up into groups of, like how we break you up into teams. So it's actually broken up into little groups. And each group has many muscle fibers inside it okay so this one group which is bro it breaks it up into is known as a fascicle or a bundle so the muscle itself is made up of many bundles each bundle is known as a fascicle covering each fascicle uh, i apologize one this outer layer is known not as perimycin the outer layer is called epimycin epi is on the outside I apologize. The outer layer is called epimysium, this outside. Epi, if you remember, epidermis going around on the outside. This fascicle is surrounded, each fascicle here, each fascicle is surrounded by a layer which goes around. This one is called perimysium. And then inside each fascicle are these muscle cells. Each cell has its own connective tissue going around and that is known as endomycium. Okay, so there are a lot of names going around. So just to again show this to you. So imagine you have a muscle like this. It's surrounded by connective tissue on the outside which is called epimycium. This sends in connective tissue in, into it, dividing it into many bundles. Each bundle is surrounded by something known as perimysium, peri meaning going around. Inside each bundle are the individual muscle cells which are covered by something known as endo. So if you remember, epi is outside, endo is inside, peri is in between. Okay? So let's look at these individual muscles cardiac, smooth, and um, uh, skeletal and see the difference between them. So let's look at skeletal first. So here can you see these lines? This is what is meant by striation. So you can see the lines here in skeletal muscle. So this is why it's called striated. And this is made because of those myofilaments present inside. And skeletal muscle is actually because muscle cells fused with one another. So they were, they started out being cells like this. And each cell had nuclei on the periphery of the cell. But what happened, these cell boundaries in between, they got lost. So it became one long cell. And so that's why we call them as cylinders. But the nuclei stayed. So can you see a muscle cell in skeletal muscle will have many nuclei. So we often say it is multinucleated, meaning many nuclei. And the nuclei are present just below the cell membrane or below the sarcolemma. So they're present below the cell membrane. So if I take a section through like this and I look at it here, 
in cross section this is where the nucleus will be present so this is often known as hypolemmal nuclei hypo meaning below the cell membrane hypolemmal nuclei because these because these um, cells have fused they form a continuous sort of long cell so that is what is called a syncytium so in skeletal muscle this long cylinder is what is known as syncytium which means fusion of cells so it becomes one long cell okay so that is very typical of skeletal muscle long cylinders multinucleated hypolemmal nuclei with striations of course so you have to you must remember they are striated compare this to cardiac muscle cardiac muscle is also striated so this is also striated so this is cardiac muscle so this is also striated but here the cells are short they they are not long cylinders so they are short like this is one cell this is one cell this is another cell we show one cell like this which is branching this way okay so these are short cells but the cells branch so you may have a cell like this which is short you may have a cell which shows a branch like this then another cell here you may have another one here which may branch out this way so you can see that the cells are branching so that's a very typical feature of cardiac muscle single nucleus unlike this multinucleated and it has striations you can see these striations these striations tend to be absent where the nucleus is if you pay attention to this picture you can see that you have these lines going across but wherever there's a nucleus you don't see those lines but everywhere else you see these lines you can see this branching here this area one part one area here you can see branching other areas not so well this this could be another branch here and in between the cells these lines you can see these lines here these are known as intercalated disc these wavy bluish lines which you see these are known as intercalated discs they these are here intercalated disc the boundary between two cells is formed by the structure called intercalated disc it helps to it's a tight junction it helps impulses pass from one to another one cell to another so intercalated discs are typical of cardiac muscle branching is typical of cardiac muscle it is striated single nucleus and short cells compare this to smooth muscle look at this this is smooth muscle you don't see any of these lines can you see that no lines this is all smooth muscle this is all the connective tissue in between the smooth muscle in between those bundles those perimysium that's what you're seeing here but these are all the smooth muscle cells they are very long and spindle like so they're really extremely long and spindle like here this way they actually look in, if you look under the microscope they look like fish swimming in a stream they have a central large nucleus so look that's what it looks like okay so that is smooth muscle no striations long and spindle like cells single nucleus let's look at nervous tissue now here it's made up of two types of cells in nervous tissue one is the cell which conducts impulses so these are the ones which conduct impulses these are called neurons then we have what are called supporting cells these cannot conduct impulses these are supporting cells they have other functions they don't conduct imp nerve impulses the supporting cells which are known as neuroglia 
Neuroglia are actually more than the number of neurons. If you look at the brain and the spinal cord, you have more neuroglia than neurons. They are supporting. They form a very important part of the support system for the neuron. Let's look at a neuron and what all we see in the neuron. So if you take a neuron, uh, we have something called the cell body or also called the soma or cell body of a neuron. So I'm going to draw something like this. So this area here is the cell body. Like any cell, it will have a nucleus. Very often you see a prominent nucleolus. And then you can see these little processes which come out, right? The smaller processes are known as dendrites. And the longer process is known as an axon. You always have only one axon, but you may have one or more dendrites. So the processes are dendrites and axons. The axon is the long process. The dendrite are the shorter ones. Axons are usually sing uh, are single. Dendrites can be single or many. And based on how many dendrites we have, we can actually classify the neurons. And one neuron at the end, when we do nervous system, we'll do more of it. The neuron at the end kind of makes, it sort of ends by little things like this. Now it makes contact with another neuron and that's how nerve impulses pass. They pass from here, they go down, they pass through this area, go to this other cell. So this area where they come very close to another neuron, this part is known as a synapse. So impulses pass over the synapse to go to the other cell. The neurons don't touch each other, but they come in very close contact very close to each other an impulse travels from the dendrite to the cell body to the axon down then to the dendrite and go goes out that way most of the time this is how impulse travels you can have it going other ways also but for all you know we will do what is the most common way that impulses travel and wh what they cross is the synapse now based on the number of processes or before that, let's do something called Nissel's granules. The neuron has produces a lot of uh, proteins, the, which are neurotransmitters. It also produces hormones in certain areas, like there's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus where hormones are produced. So present uh, in relation to the cell body, you have little granules present here, which are called Nissel's granules. And this is rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, rough endoplasmic reticulum manufactures and transports proteins. So that's why you see a lot of these in the cell body of the neuron. Now, based on the number of processes, we can classify neurons in different ways. If it has multiple dendrites like this, we call it a multipolar neuron. So this is an example of a multipolar neuron. A pseudo unipolar neuron is again pseudo and unipolar. That means it starts out as unipolar but then becomes something different. So unipo pseudo unipolar is here's the cell body. Unipolar means only one pole or one process. So it comes with one process and then this process divides into two parts, a dendrite and an axon. So can you see now it becomes like two, but it started out as one. So that's why we call it a pseudo unipolar. Multipolar neurons are found in the brain and spinal cord, in the gray matter of the brain and spinal cord. Multipolar. Pseudo-unipolar are seen in what are called sensory ganglia. For now, you can just write this, sensory ganglia. When we do the nervous system, we are going to do this again in more detail, but just to kind of introduce this to you. Bipolar neurons would be when two poles. So this is the cell body. So this is the cell body. One dendritic process. 
one axonal process. So can you see two poles? This is a bipolar neuron. And this is seen in your sense organs like the tongue, taste buds in your ear, retina of the eye. All these areas you have bipolar neurons. Let's look at the neuroglia, the supporting cells. So here, these are in the central nervous system, you have three main supporting cells. One are called astrocytes. The second one is called oligodendrocyte or glia. You can call it dendrocyte or glia. And the third one is called microglia. This is in the central nervous system. For now, we'll just deal with these. We have some others which when we do the nervous system, we'll go over. And in the peripheral nervous system, we have an additional cell which is called a Schwann cell. And like I mentioned, whenever you talk about a cell, you should know where it is, what its function is. So all of these lie in the central nervous system. Let's look at their function now. Astrocyte, one of the chief functions is to provide nutrition to the neuron. So it actually latches on to a blood vessel and to a neuron. So it takes nutrition from the blood vessel and transfers it to the neuron. Oligodendroglia, they lay down something called myelin, which is a fatty insulating substance around the axon. So they lay down myelin in the central nervous system. So they lay down myelin in the central nervous system. The Schwann cell lays down myelin in the peripheral nervous system. So it's different. The cells are different in the central and peripheral. They do the same job, but they are lying in different areas. The central nervous system means brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is your nerves. So what is this myelin? So if we take an axon, so again, if I draw a neuron like this, these are the dendrites and this is the axon. The axon is coated with, in some areas of the body, it's coated with this myelin, which is like a sheath like this. It's an insulating substance. It helps impulses travel faster because the impulse jumps over this myelin like this. So impulses go really fast. This space which is present where the impulses are jumping, this space is like a node. So it's called node of Ranvier. You have all, I'm sure, heard of a disease called multiple sclerosis, right? Which is called a demyelinating disease. Now what happens with people with multiple sclerosis is they are very tired. They are not able to perform their normal tasks. So what happens in them is that this myelin has gone. It's been removed because the body has attacked it. It's a, it is an autoimmune disease. So when it has been attacked, the myelin over here is gone. So the, the impulse can no longer travel from here to here because it has to actually jump over the myelin. There is no myelin, so it's not able to do anything. So that's why impulse transmission doesn't occur. So with the result, they're not able to do what they should be doing. They may... Uh, their muscles may get weak or even their uh, sensory functions may be lost. There are some cells in the body which do not have myelin. So they are just smooth. So if there are some neurons in the body, there's no myelin. So it's just smooth like this. So impulse conduction is slower in these cells because, you know, the impulse has to travel along the entire length instead of hopping like that. You know, think of the myelin as overpasses. So, you know, you can travel faster when you have an overpass rather than going the entire length down a, a road. Microglia are phagocytic. So again, you have another phagocyte. Neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages, microglia. So look at them. There are so many which are phagocytic. The properties of nervous tissue, it's conduction of impulses. It's irritable. You know, it's capable of being stimulated and reacting to stimuli. As I said, Hormone secretion in some areas of the brain, they produce neurotransmitters and in the hypothalamus some hormones are produced. So these are some of the properties. 
So here if you look at a slide of nervous tissue, so this is the cell body, this is the nucleus, you can barely make out the nucleolus. This thick process is the axon, here this is the axon, all the other tinier processes are the dendritic processes, here going this way. And these little dots which you are seeing, you can only see them as dots because you have to get really high power in order to be able to see these neuroglia uh, properly. These are the neuroglia, which you can't tell from just the dots whether it's an astrocyte, an oligodendrocyte or a Schwann cell. Okay.